So what I always tell people first and foremost is if you don't have a great product or a great service, do not do marketing because you'll put that business out of business real fast. A mediocre product with great marketing is still a mediocre product. A great product with mediocre marketing, you can move the needle quite a bit. A great product with great marketing and you can become the next transformational brand. Welcome to the Realtors Pursuit of Winning Podcast. My name is Rick Beekins. I am going to be your host today, and we have Pete Cena in the in the studio. How are you today, sir? Good to see you, Rick. Good to see you. You too, man. You too. And, and remind me again, where are you calling in from? Calling from New Haven, Connecticut. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. The weather's just starting to break, right? Finally. <laughs> I, I ask myself you. every year during the winter, why do I live here? Why do I live here? And then the spring comes and I'm like, it's so nice. And then I'm like, yes. next year, why do I live here? Why do I live here? I, I, I made that escape. I was, uh, we, were, we were in Pennsylvania. I remember our last year there and we got like 14, 15 inches of snow, you know? And, you know, I, I had the ingenious idea, you know, I went to, I, I didn't want the snow plows to plow us in. So I had the ingenious idea, you know, great forethought here of, parking in the in the parking lot behind where we lived okay oh man and the owner of said parking lot decided he wasn't gonna plow or clean up either so we're, so we're, we're digging out like <laughs> yeah. so yeah it's just like you know we're, we're we're moving down south after this we're moving down south so anyway uh thank you again for being on the show um i'm looking forward to having our conversation so let's do this let's give the audience a little bit of a background on who you are and what you do and, and why you do what you do so we'll let, turn it over to you yeah so i like to always start with why so why i do what i do is that i think that creativity and curiosity are broken and when you think differently you can achieve different results and differentiation i think is the, the name of the game because while everyone's trying to fit in, I think we're also trying to stand out. And I think you can't stand out by fitting in. So um, rewind back to me as a kid, I was an introverted, nerdy kid, kind of found software as a solace and a thing that kind of gave me sanity at a young age. So um, I always got along better with computers than I do with humans. So I taught myself how to code as a little kid and then became kind of, you know, whiz kid coder to teaching myself how to design because I just wanted to have things look as good as the apps that I was building and then got into design and software. And I discovered this thing called marketing and it's, you know, a big, pretty big buzz where a lot of people hear marketing, but there's not a lot of great marketers out there. There's a lot of people who are in marketing, but there's not a lot of great marketers out there. So at a young age, I went from software and design into marketing and branding. What I realized for companies is that your story is your strategy and how you express that strategy makes a massive difference between success and failure. So ultimately um, when I was at UConn, where I went to school, during my time as going to UConn, I started working for a large sports marketing company that now is owned by Disney, and ultimately got to work on some high-profile projects at a really young age. And as a result of that, that led to me deciding to start a creative agency at the time. And at the time, I brought together design and tech and marketing under one roof, and that was pretty rare back then. Now it's expected, right? If you don't have the technology inside your company, you're, you're failing, right? Or you've already lost. Um, so that was the early part of my of my career is, you know, I started my first company when I was like, I think, I don't know, 18, 19 years old. Um, grew that to a national company, working with some of the biggest brands in the world. And then I got the pleasure, the privilege to start investing in companies, early stage companies, tech companies. Um, and I had a couple of, couple of wins there, a couple of losses, got early in some companies, um, some of which went on to go public. And then now what I do and why I do it is because creativity and curiosity is broken. And I want to be able to give every person the ability to take their business, their life to the next level. And the way to do that is through creativity, it's through curiosity, but not just creativity and curiosity. Those are buzzwords, right? Rick is like how to think creatively, how to think divergently, right? So I talk about this idea of divergent thinking, divergent creativity, going in places that others don't. And that's where the unconventional leads to extraordinary from a results perspective. So that's just a little bit about what I do and how I do it. Um, but I hope that's, that answers the question. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you gave me a whole lot to unpack here. So, you know, I'm, I, want, I want to start back with, um, I don't know where I want to start. One of, one of the things that you talked about was the idea that, um, you know, people don't necessarily ha know how to brand, you know, and, and I think, again, for, I think from the perspective of, 
you know, a, a business owner, you know, and, and we've got to be able to have a unique voice in the marketplace in order to attract the ideal customer, you know, for us, you know, and I know a lot of times, um, you know, I see, I see business owners going in with a, a list of features like, Hey, you know what? Our software can do this, 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 and this, and this, you know, and it's, it's like, I know that they struggle, you know, with, with that message, you know, what, what is, what is, what is what is your story about how to you know, I guess kind of guide people into getting it getting into that right conversation, if you will? Yeah, so I think it's funny because I said I always like to start with why, and you know Simon Sinek says start with why, but I actually think that when you're as far as a tech company goes, I think you have to start with who, right? So what I always say is like you got to name your audience. And you got to name the shift you create in the world, right? So show me the world before they found your user product. Show me the world after they're using it and they're happy. Like, what does that shift look like? When you sell the shift, you ultimately then carve out differentiation in your market. Whether you create the category or own the category um, or really just disrupt the category, that's the best way to stand out, right? When you look at the different pillars that drive brands, one of the least expensive ways to stand out is differentiation. One of the more expensive ways to stand out is, you know, building brand and advertising, that sort of thing, because you need consistency, right? Nike doesn't become Nike because of a swoosh in colors and fonts, right? Nike becomes Nike because they spent billions of dollars attaching themselves to in designing culture as, as a system, right? Like, you know, some people say that MJ made Nike. Some people say that Nike made MJ. Um, I think we know that art imitates culture and culture imitates art. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Wow. That's, uh, that's well said. Um, I lost my train of thought. Unfortunately, I, I had, I had a follow up question there and, and I promise you it was, it was, it was really, really good. <laughs> um, so you said, start, you said, start with who, um, and what I, what I heard or what I think I heard is that, um, we're not looking at not looking at it from the perspective of you know what what are their pain points, you know, but where perhaps you know what are the opportunities? Is is that did I get that right? I don't think you got it wrong. So um, what I would say as a build, right? Yes, and as we like to say in the world I live in, is is never kind of it's no but, but it's yes and, right? So the yes and for me, what I would say is, you want to sell the magic gifts, you want to sell the promised land. And the promised land ultimately is informed by the problems, right? So for example, like last night I couldn't sleep, right? I was up super late and it wasn't because anything was wrong. I was just kind of hyped up. I was excited about my day today. Um, I was thinking about a lot of stuff. And so I didn't have a problem, right? But I woke up this morning kind of tired. I was like, oh man, I'm a little bit tired. So if yesterday when I couldn't sleep last night and I was scrolling my phone at one o'clock in the morning... If I got hit with an IG ad or a TikTok ad or wherever, and it was like, stop staying up too late and not getting enough sleep, you know, did you know that you might need some melatonin and magnesium in, in, in your world? I'm like, what's that? And then if I read something about that, that context of it's past 1 a.m. on Eastern Standard Time, now you're showing me the promise, right? Now you're showing me a person who's well slept in the ad, who's got, you know, commanding the room the next day. I'm like, oh, I should probably go to sleep. And then tomorrow, if I see another ad with that brand, I'm like, you know what? The promised land for me is a good night's sleep. I didn't actually have a problem. I wasn't what they call problem aware. So I think what sometimes people do is they focus too much on the problem and not enough on the outcome. And I think you can convert a person who's not problem aware into a customer the same way that you can convert a person who is problem aware into a customer, but you have to understand what ultimately is the thing that you do for them. What does that promised land look like? And that's how you help them get there. Because people buy transformations, right? We, we don't want to buy the heavier version of ourselves, right? We, we want to buy the, the lighter version of ourselves, the, the brighter version of ourselves. And that's where the transformation comes in, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you start dipping into 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 marketing. Um, let's go back to you know we, you talked about a lot of people um, don't know how to market. You know this is something that is is certainly um, you know a mystery box, if you will, for for a lot of business owners. You know we're you know we're putting hey it's like hey we have great stuff. How come our, people aren't buying our stuff? I mean, um, give us some insight on that. What do you what are you what are you what's your thinking? Yeah. So what I always tell people is there's a pretty simple formula to crack anything with marketing, right? 
the formula I use is I call it ACT and I call it MVE, right? So you can put them together. It's ACT, MVE. I'll break it down really quick, right? So first ACT, A-C-T. Who is your audience? What's the message you're communicating to that audience to move them? What are the triggers and touch points that are going to ultimately move them there, right? I'll model that in just a second. And then what is the MVE or the minimum valuable, not viable, but minimum valuable experience that's going to be able to bring that to life for them, right? So what I always tell people first and foremost is if you don't have a great product or a great service, do not do marketing because you'll put that business out of business real fast. You know, a mediocre product with great marketing is still a mediocre product, right? A great product with mediocre marketing, you can move the needle quite a bit. A great product with great marketing, and you can become the next transformational brand. So let's break it down now. Okay, so give an example. This marker, right? Brand called Expo. I like Expo because when I buy the generic whiteboard markers, they're not as good, right? There's a bunch of other brands. I kind of forgot them, but I know Expo. I buy Expo. If anybody ever brings me a, a marker for my whiteboard that's not an Expo, I'm throwing them out of the room, you know? Not really throwing them out, but you know what I mean, right? So who's the audience, right? The audience is it, like, if I'm trying to buy this particular Expo marker, I'll start with this product for a second. The audience is someone who spends more than a few hours a week using a whiteboard, right? They want a high quality whiteboard, right? So in this case, it might be a business professional. It might be a work from home professional. It might be someone who wants to visualize their thoughts, who, who appreciates and loves an analog tactile nature. Again, it's a digital guy. I love a whiteboard marker, right? Because it's impermanent. You know, when I get into Figma, or one of these tools, these programs, I want everything to be beautiful, right? Versus a whiteboard, I could just erase it with my hand or paper towel, whatever it is, right? So the audience, right? There you go. A, right? Communication. So what I want to communicate is the quality of what I need, right? So it's like when an idea hits you, Rick, you don't want your marker to be a dud. You want to make sure that the speed that the idea is that marker delivers for you. So I'm going to communicate that message of efficacy, communicate that this, this marker is always going to be there for me, right? Communication. And then triggers and touch points, right? So where do I reach that? I can reach that in an Instagram ad. I can reach that in a, a TikTok ad. I can reach that on a billboard. I can reach that at a trade show where I'm giving some of these away potentially for people who might be in a whiteboarding conference room. So where are the triggers and touch points to reach them? And then it comes to MVE, which is minimum valuable experiences. And minimum valuable experiences, it could be a really well done landing page that communicates the right message to me. It could be a really well done ad that when I click through that ad, it takes me to a lead magnet, right? Like... 10 things on how to create the best whiteboard experience or whatever it is, right? So again, audience communication, trigger touch point, minimum viable experience. I teach that because when I, as a marketer for more than 20 years, a lot of times people get too academic with their marketing. You know, they want to talk about four P's and six P's and all these extra things. And they're important. Don't get me wrong. I've read every book that's been recognized as a top book when it comes to marketing or branding. But then I talked to a 17-year-old kid who knows nothing about branding, but what she knows or he knows is how to connect with people emotionally, authentically. And then all of a sudden, boom, they got millions of YouTube followers and they're making 15, 20, 30, $40,000 a month at 17 years old. You know, a month, right? With no education, no college education. But what they understand is culture. So for me, I like to keep it simple, right? It's like, how do you get people to act, ACT? And then how do you, it's, it's like ACT and MVE, like anybody can remember that, right? And yeah, if you break that down, right? Like we could break it down. We could get all in the weeds. We could talk about positioning and value prop statements and unarticulated needs. And we could, I could get real nerdy with everybody, but the reality is everyone's busy, right? So I like to take good marketers and make them great. I like to take inexperienced teams and make them experts. I strip it out all the bullshit. So that's how I do it. And to answer your first question about tech is like the problem with us, with tech founders, I know, cause I used to be one is we get high on our own supply. It's like, we're sniffing those markers. We're like, Oh, 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 my product is democratizing artificial intelligence on the blockchain. It's like, no, no, no. You're saving someone time and not giving them fake records. That's what people want. Are you sick of having your identity stolen? Well, go to my product because it does these things. No one cares that it's AI, blockchain, whatever widget, widget, buzzword. People want to buy better versions of themselves. People want to save time. They want entertainment. They want value. They want utility. You check all those boxes and that's where the ACT MVE comes into play. It's quite literally that simple. 
Yeah, yeah. Where you, you talked about tech companies. I mean, where, where else do you see or what, what kind of mistakes or missteps um, do you see, you know, other, other companies making? So I think a big mistake that companies make is they get, they think they get too big to fail and in efforts to try to create structure, predictability, and reliability, they end up creating these like large, elaborate, complex matrix organizations and the silos that they create with good intention, should I say, but the good intention often, often gets paved with bad behavior. And what I mean by that specifically is what ends up happening is that road that they're trying to get to, which is growth and scale and, and consistency. It's all good intention. But then what I think happens with a lot of big tech companies, and I work with many of them, I'm not going to out specific ones, but what I would say is they get disconnected from the end mission, from the end vision. They get sort of spun in the, in the day of do, 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 do. And then they get further and further and further from their customer. And I think that's a big distinction, right? And you look at like the Amazons of the world about being customer obsessed. You look at some companies who say how human centered they are with their, with their principles. The companies that live those customer obsessed principles, the companies that close the gap between the people doing the work and the end customer, those are the companies that I think have awareness. And those are the companies that I think that can win. And I think that a lot of tech companies lose that in themselves, right? Like Google used to be a couple of engineers together in a room. And now one of the most sophisticated companies in the world that they can't even launch an image generation algorithm without generating the wrong pictures of our forefathers, right? And you saw that big debacle that happened recently with Google and their AI art image creation, right? That's not because Google isn't talented as hell. It's not because Google doesn't have the best people on the planet. It's because they're so damn big they're like an oil tanker that can't steer its way away from the iceberg versus the speedboat or the cigar boats able to turn on a dime. So I empathize with those companies because many of those companies are my clients and I've made a very great living working with them. I'm not saying names specifically, just abstractly. But yeah, that's what I think happens with tech companies a lot. You, know, you, you, you made um, and you made you made an illusion where you talked about. I think when we think about marketing, we're thinking about, you know, maybe that outreach or, you know, inbound or whatever, um, attracting customers, but you talked about a connection, um, beyond, I guess the tactical marketing, um, that we're used to thinking about when we talk about marketing, can you talk about that a little bit? Happy to, I mean, give me a deeper sense of what would be helpful to cover. Cause that, that's sort of a big, that's a big question. I, th I think sometimes when I look at marketing, I look at, I look at it from the perspective of the entire, you know, customer experience, you know, it's like, what does that initial engagement look like or interaction look like? What is it, you know, during the buying process? What is it during the uh, customer engagement or, you know, while we're, you know, doing a project or whatever? Um, and so, you know, I've, I've, I've thought about marketing in that perspective. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think I think you have to understand the sum total of the experiences is what the customer appreciates or they either promote or detract from, right? So like if it's really painful to get logged into your system, even if once you're logged in, everything's great, if the few steps before that are a huge pain in the ass and then somebody else has an equally good experience to yours, but they just fix the friction in the login process. I just use that as an example or onboarding or customer success, whatever you want to call it. You're going to lose customers to that. You know, I think controlling friction in an experience is massively important. Sometimes you want to slow down the user. Sometimes you want to speed up the user. Sometimes you want to add friction. Sometimes you want to slow down friction. I'll give you an example of that. Um, do you have an iPhone or an Android phone? Uh, Android. Okay. Uh, so the audience that's listening to this, hopefully some of you have iPhones, but what I'll say is when you first get your new iPhone, Apple does a thing with their packaging where when you open it, it's engineered to make a specific sound. It almost pops when it opens. So I go, I go, and the amount of time that went into how they designed that packaging to do that, right? The decision that they made when you go to open it, instead of having to cut it, cut certain things, there's now a little tab you can pick and pull all the decisions that go into that packaging journey, some of them slow you down, right? Like when you turn an Apple phone on, 
it's not like a 1980s computer. It doesn't need a minute and a half to boot up, right? Why do you sit there with the Apple logo the first time you turn it on and it's just you're waiting on the screen with that? Because they're creating that branded moment, right? They could go right to the thing, but as you're sitting there waiting for that phone to turn on, you're staring at it and being reminded of this is an Apple phone. And then there's the things that they're doing through every customer point, touch point in the journey that remind you that this is an Apple experience, right? It could be the copy, it could be the story, it could be the consistency, but that is how Apple is Apple, right? And, you know, the people at Expo could do the same thing, right? Like if I was on a landing page trying to sell markers and I buy more than a few hundred dollars worth of markers a month because of all the workshops we do, as an example, I know what that little dust feels like on my fingers from the whiteboard markers. So let's have that kind of build up a little bit on the edges of the screen when I'm on a landing page, right? These are the unconscious decisions that great design, well, consciously we make decisions as designers, but people unconsciously pick up on that, right? I call that the magic 5%, right? And where I got that 5% from is if you look at Disney and some of their greatest experiences, how they design theme parks, how they design experiences, they're designing for those magic moments that 95% of people are not going to see. But we feel those experiences, right? Whether it's the scent we feel when we walk into a nice day spa that makes us feel a certain way, whether it's the key visual that happens every time we turn on that game or open up that app, these are the things that create lasting impressions in our brains. And that ultimately is what moves what I call biology. And I don't mean biology like science. I mean bi, B-U-Y-ology, which is what makes us buy. And it's those kinds of decisions that I think tech companies, when done right, it's why they have great product teams or design teams or engineering teams. That's why companies like Linear right now, if you heard of Linear, the project management tool, kicking the living shit out of the Atlassians of the world, right? Because you want to use Linear, like small team, it's fast, it's scalable, it's quick, it's super intentional. Or do you want to use clunky ass Jira? I don't know about you, but I want to use Linear. And the reality is, is because Linear feels like the rebel. They feel like the one with the innovative spirit. Now, I'm sure just like Atlassian, right? A couple of years from now, Linear will be the big Goliath thing with thousands of people. And when that happens, somebody else will come in, right? They'll be the oil tanker that's moving slow, trying to dodge the, the cliff. And the cigar boat will come in and, and out, outperform them. And that is what I think is the beauty of like this diffusion of innovation, as it was once called, right? This idea of like early adopters and laggards and late majority. It's like, how do you smash the two together, you know? The guys on the left of the chart or the gals on the left of the chart, they want to go from innovative early adopter to more scale. People on the right side of the chart, they have all the scale of the audience. They want more innovation. So it's like they're pushing right. They're pushing left. What's that exchange look like? And that's hard to do. Um, I'm grateful that it's hard to do because it's job security for me and my teams. Um, we get brought in to help with that. Um, but yeah, that's what that's what I mean by like I think people sometimes forget about the basic principles of uh, of marketing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. 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 That was a, that was a lot. That was, um, it was great. I, um, I, it, it, I, I was thinking about, uh, well, when I was younger, uh, I lived in, I lived in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, uh, where the Crayola factory is. And so, you know, you call there, you know, and just like have a colorful day. I'm just like, wow, mind blown. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. You Love know, it. um, and you still remember that, right? Cause it, how many years ago was that for you? It was more than 20 years ago. And you remember I mean, like it was yesterday. Literally. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's these experiences that I think, um, you know, as business owners, if we're if we're thinking about that, thinking in that way, you know, it gives us that edge. You know, it's yeah. like people still like to do business with with people, people they know and like. Hundred percent. So t tell me something. So you know, you you talked about you know growing into that Goliath firm. I mean, how do you? Um, you know, as a firm, you know, maintain some of that, that, that closeness, you know, to your, to your, uh, to your audience. I think it's hard because I think it's a cultural challenge, right? And I want to just be really clear. I've worked for companies with thousands of employees. I've worked with companies with thousands of employees. I've never built and ran a company with thousands of employees. So first I want to just start from a place of empathy, which is, I don't know what I don't know because I haven't done that. I'd imagine if I found myself in their shoes, I would be experiencing the same challenges or similar challenges. What I do know is when we've been brought in by companies with thousands of employees, how we've helped them 
has been through design, right? We've helped them to design a better experience. That might be the language, that might be the behaviors, that might be the user interfaces, that might be the technologies, right? Um, I think sometimes it really starts from like just basic human needs, which is people want to feel heard, they want to feel seen, they want to feel loved, and they want to feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. Now you can say to an HR person, they'll probably tell you that that's culture, that's uh, psychological safety, that's a lot of really smart HR talk that that I think is really important. But it, at the end of the day, I think the way that you you stay innovative is the culture, right? You look at companies like Netflix, you look at companies like Airbnb, they're giant organizations, but they're still pretty damn innovative. I have friends that work at both of them. And I think what it comes down to is small teams doing big things. And you could be a few thousand people, but I think you could still have small teams within teams. And I think the idea of team of teams and team within teams, that's where I think the magic happens, right? One of my favorite books, Rick, was a book by the name of Drive. You ever read it? No, no, it's on my list though. Great book, great book. So, so Dan Pink wrote this book called Drive. It's kind of a seminal title. He used to be a speech writer, so he knows a thing or two about rhetoric. And the book, what stood out to me, that sort of have a colorful day moment that you remember from 20 years ago. I remember when I read Drive, which was people typically are intrinsically or extrinsically motivated. Extrinsically being the carrot and the stick. When I do this, this thing happens. You don't want to go after that that motivation. That's a, that's a scary one because that's a, that's a hedonic treadmill. That's a loop, right? Intrinsic motivation from the inside, self-motivated person, they're looking for three things. They're looking for purpose, they're looking for mastery, and they're looking for autonomy, right? That purpose, autonomy, mastery, those are the three three codes to unlocking motivation from teams. So again, we all know about purpose. We all talk about that, right? Autonomy is an important one, right? People, like people wonder why so many people post-COVID don't want to go back to the office. And it's because we gave people a sense of autonomy and agency to work when they want, where they want, how they want. And people don't want to go back to, I have to be in the office working this way, right? Autonomy, a sense of control over my destiny in my life is really important to people, whether you're an employee, an entrepreneur, or everywhere in between, right? And then mastery, right? People want to feel like they're getting progressively better at something. No one wants to feel stuck, right? Stagnation is death in nature. Like if you go, up, go up to a pond, the water is stagnant it gets bacteria. If you were to drink from that pond, you would die, right? Stagnation's death, right? We have to keep moving. Um, nature has to keep moving, right? The, the root word of currency is to flow, right? We have to flow. We have to move. So that's why people need purpose, a sense of why, a bigger direction, you know, vision, values, mission, autonomy, right? Control over their own destiny, feeling like it's not happening to them, but they're part of it. And then obviously master, I want to feel like I'm getting better, right? The, the sort of Malcolm Gladwell-esque thing of 10,000 hours of mastery, right? Or that's what he, he said in his book, right? So I think it's that drive, that Daniel Pink reference I made that stuck with me and sticks with me to this day because if you can work in a small team or a big team and people have intrinsic motivation and they have clarity of where that vision is and the mission that they're on, as long as everyone understands it, they're going to kill for you. They're going to crush for you, right? But it's easier said than done. Because we're all busy, right? We're all chasing that next deadline, that next deliverable. It's really hard to take a pause and remind people of where they're at in that journey and remind people of where it's at. One of my favorite things I, I do with um, with my own teams is if I see an employee is kind of starting to get a little bit salty, right? Maybe they're a little bit frustrated. When we're interviewing new people, I'll put them on the interview committee because then they get to interview the new people. And what they often will do is the interviewee will ask them a question about like, well, tell me what it's like to do such and such, such and such. And then my team member will get excited because they'll go back to that, that positive memory. And that's like a little cheat code that I've used over the years just to get people to remember that oftentimes there's more good than bad. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, but I feel like it's those little things. And that's where like great cultures that have great HR people and great leaders. I see with some of my clients that are in tech, um, they know how to stimulate the humans, right? Technology should be a catalyst for humans, 
not a barrier or a constraint, right? It's the companies that use tech as a weapon. Those are the companies that ultimately, I think, end up with the, the worst cultures and the worst teams. The companies that use technology as an unlock to help the customer, to help the team, to have a vision, those are the companies I see kicking ass and taking names today. I love it. I love it. You know, um, one, 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 of the, um, one of the areas that I, I think would be really great to talk about is, is like internal marketing, you know, which is, you know, really, I, th I think, closely related to uh, what you were just sharing. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Is that, you know, and, I, and I'm thinking, you know, is that is something that's a plan, something that's very intentional? Is that something that's kind of organic? What, what, what are your thoughts? Everything is an onion, right? It's like that Shrek quote. I have a two and a half year old and, and I'm just reminded of Shrek with the onion. It was just like layers, right? We have to start at the kernel, right? We have to start at the core DNA. We have to start at the atomic level of a company. And in order to do that, we have to go inside out. You can't go outside in, right? Because I think inside out allows you to ensure that the people that are serving your customer, they're bought in, right? And one of the easiest things to do, and again, I, just to be clear, I'm not an expert in change management. I've done a lot of work around that, but I'm not an expert in it. But what I would say is when the inside matches the outside and the distance between the two is very, very small, magic happens. The bigger the gap between what the insider employees think and the customers think, the bigger that gap, the bigger the void. The bigger the void, the bigger the disconnection is. So I think always aim to make the internal narrative and the external narrative as closely together as possible. Obviously, that, that can't always be the truth for certain reasons, but I think that's really where you got to start from the inside out, right? When we're launching a new brand for companies, we do it all the time. We always start inside out because if people have to be bought in. If people aren't bought in, they're not going to buy it, right? I've heard it happen. Like I remember walking into a coffee shop, where was I? Austin, Texas. And the employee was kind of like, in a cranky mood, right? And I was like, oh, how's your day going? And they're just like, all right. And I was like, hey, so can you, I, I, I'm trying to get an Uber. Like, what is this place called? And they're like, they just like frustratedly said the name of it. I forgot what it was. I'm like, oh, what do you mean? And I was like, it, and I'm like holding the cup and the cup had a different name on it. I guess they had just bought, bought by another place or something. And they were changing names. And you can just tell that, that employee was just not bought into that decision, right? So they were just like frustrated. So then my experience as the, as the patron who just bought a $5 coffee, right? in Austin, Texas was like, why did I come here? Why didn't I just go to Starbucks? You know? Um, but I was trying to shop local and support local. But I think that employee clearly didn't have the right internal rollout, the right internal narrative, right? They weren't told, Hey, we're moving to this new name because it's going to add more capabilities, more flavors, whatever the reasoning is that they were, they were coming together. But that I think is a, really real example that we as consumers feel every single day. And when it's done right, we, we're happy. When it's done wrong, we're really mad. Like I'm super mad about the fact that Google bought Nest, right? I believed in Nest as a, as a company. I had their thermostats, their alarms, all their other stuff. And then one day I just get hit with this message. I can't log in because I don't have a Google account. And then the next day it's like, hey, you got to upgrade. The, the alarm's not going to work on April 1st. And I'm like, what do you mean? You know, I spent probably like, I don't know, 2000 bucks on that stupid system. Right. And now I'm like, now I got to re replace it. That's an example of like, sometimes we're like the external doesn't match the internal. And, and, well, um, I guess the, the other part to that is, you know, so I think, I think on one hand, I heard you talking about, you know, including them in a brand rollout. Um, and I'm wondering on the other side of that though, uh, you, you talked about like the, I guess, well, I guess what I'm thinking about is like the company mission. So we we had a project where we rolled out, you know, helped the uh, owner build a mission, vision, all that good stuff. And so one of the things I wanted to do is, like you were saying, is is really get that employee buy in, but at the at the core, at the seed level, you know, rather than at the um, tactical level, if you will. And so that's 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 really where I'd I'd like to hear hear your thoughts. Yeah, well, I think tactical is important, right? Because people sometimes get get the whole strategy tactical thing wrong. In my opinion, I think that it comes down to the feeling, right? And feeling is, is attached to the experience and the experience is attached to the story and the story is attached to whatever the ultimate strategy is or isn't right. So if I just walked around and gave everybody in the room, a green marker, like what the hell is that? Right. But if I walk around and said, starting next month, we are becoming a green company. 
and the marker you're holding in your hand is made with uh, plant-based inks and recycled plastic and everything starts with a single mark. So what I want everyone to do is go up to this wall, sign your name with this environmentally friendly marker. And over the next six to 12 months, we are going to get our business to become, you know, carbon neutral because we are dedicated to trying to repair this beautiful mother earth that we live on. You know, while all these tech companies are focusing on AI and faster chips and faster things, we're going to focus on doing our part to make the environment well. And we're moving our servers. We're doing these different things and we're, we're, we're going to be a lead certified building and all these different things. Now, the next day when you come in and you open your laptop and there's a green marker on your table, it means something because you, as a rite of passage, as a rite of transition and change, change and transition are really important for people. Like going up and signing that thing, that physical experience. Now, every time you walk by that wall, you remember my name is there surrounded by my colleagues, right? Find this marker. So now this marker, which is just a freaking marker, plays a much bigger role in the transformation of this company because of that. Now, I just made that up, right? But that's a parallel or an experience I can give you that a lot of companies face, right? Like a, like a good example is um, recently I was talking to a group of people about spicy food, right? And I like spicy food, not super spicy. But one of the things I said to those, hey, did you guys ever watch the show on uh, Hulu? It's about like people who eat hot peppers and we started going back and forth and they're like, yeah, we should do a hot ones challenge, right? you know, like the TV show and blah, 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 blah. And I wasn't a part of it. I was traveling, but the team went and then did a hot ones challenge together. And they still talk about it to this day, you know? So it's like, that's an example of like, sometimes now if I was rebranding that company, right? What I, and maybe the, I'm rebranding the company and I'm like, I want everyone to have spicy points of view. Imagine if I gave a branded hot sauce out to everyone on that team and we did a hot sauce challenge together as a team and as a gift, everyone got this bottle of hot sauce afterwards. And it was on everyone's desk. Now it becomes not just a paperweight, but something on someone's desk going, wow, never thought of it like that, right? So like, that's where like, you know, I'll give you an example of how we did that. So one of the most powerful scents, if you're able to do it, is smell, right? Olfactory experience, right? When we first launched our last campus with our building, gave everyone a welcome package when we brought them into the building. This is pre-COVID since the world was still very much in person. And inside the welcome box for every single person, we had a custom candle with a custom scent that everyone got to have. It was a branded candle, kind of had our own fragrance, the whole thing. But that's just an example of like, people talked about those candles for like two years. These candles cost us like $10 a candle per person, you know? It was worth every penny because it creates those moments and it's those moments that create these monumental shifts in our lives. And that's where like, I get excited as a person who's branding, hopefully you can hear the passion of my voice is like, that defies marketing, right? Marketing is truth. And when told properly, it can, it can set the world, you know, in a really different trajectory or course. You know, I, I, I hear, um, I hear, so what I hear when you say that is, you know, we, we build sense of camaraderie. You know the hot sauce challenge, the candles. You know I've I've you know seen other other scenarios where where team building was done and people remembered it, and and that's great I think for culture. But you know when you talked about your your marketing process, you know putting together a marketing plan, um, you know getting the communication everything else together, can we do that inside a company? So that we're getting you know not just camaraderie, but we're getting true buy in you know, for the, you know, we're selling the mission at this point, we're selling the vision for the company, you know, we're doing this intentionally. I mean, is, is that something that a makes sense? B is worth it. C perhaps you've done or seen. Yeah, I do. I do think it is. Um, so let me give you an example of that. Right. I think a lot of team building is super fucking hokey right? It's cheesy because it's not well-designed. But, you know, I think about like one of my favorite books was a book by, um, what's his name? 
Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. Daniel Kahneman, I think, I, I can't recall. But basically what he talks a lot about is how do you... He talks about like system one, system two, like the way the brain works, blah, blah, blah. But, but I, I distinctly remember in that book or something tied to that book, it was like they were, they went into these hospitals and these hospitals were having like super high, like I don't, whether it was like death rates or something like that, that was happening. And what happened was, and I might botch this, so please fact check this. It was either this Thinking Fast and Slow book or another book. I think it is. I, I definitely need some more afternoon caffeine. But like, so basically what happened was, people were dying in these hospitals, whether they were infants or whatever it was. And what they realized was everyone wanted to help. And when everyone wanted to help, they just jumped in. So what they did is they took these like surgeons and these different people and they like trained them on like F1 race car pit crews and different things. And what's different about an F1 race car pit crew, and I've actually done this exercise with my team, is playing a before and after of a bad pit crew and a good pit crew. Well, the difference in a good pit crew is, is that I don't know if you're, do you know what the difference is? No. Uh -uh. So I didn't either, right? It was kind of surprised me, which is the difference in a pit crew is that everyone knows exactly what the role in their job is. Okay. Right. The lug nuts on the bolts on the, on the wheel, filling the gas. Like everyone has a very, very specific thing. So when the shit hits the fan, if you're well-trained in it, everyone knows their role. Right. As opposed to everyone's jumping in trying to help and it just becomes this big mess, right? So why right. did I say that? Well, I said that because can you imagine for a moment if you're trying to get a team to work together pr precisely, should we all go do a trust fall with some like random leadership hokey thing in like, you know, Camp Guatemala? Or should we bring people together as a team to go see an F1 race and meet an F1 pit crew and teach them how each of their roles matter and then go back and really continue to repeat to them this is your role and this is how you're part of the, you're the one thing in this machine that makes the magic work. And everyone feels like their, their thing has to work. Like team, like the first one team building, like on some hokey thing, stupid, cringy, crunchy, whatever. The second one laser focused on the vision of the company and where you're trying to go and the problem you're trying to solve. So I just think that that, that applies when I think about team building is like people have to understand the, what, the, why, the, how, and how they fit into that. And that's where like, I think I've gotten it wrong a lot as a leader, right? I used to think that like making people feel better about themselves was the way to win. The way to win is making people feel better in the communities that they sit in, right? Because everyone wants to feel like they're achieving. No one wants to feel like they're failing, right? So I think that's where like, I made a lot of mistakes as a leader early on is like, just trying to figure out like, like, what inspires Rick might not be what inspires Pete. And like how I motivate Rick might be different than how I motivate Pete. And I spent probably like 15 years trying to figure that shit out. I'm still figuring that shit out. Right. Um, so sometimes I think we all kind of get lost in our own sauce, you know? Yeah, absolutely. 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 So it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a never ending story. I think it's, um, you know, it requires a lot of personal growth and, and, and insight and, and giving, you yeah. know what I mean? As, I, as amen. I couldn't agree with you more. Time. Yeah, as business owners, I mean, we're just so hyper focused, you know, on success, dealing with issues, et cetera, et cetera. We can't get away from the people, which is what enables us to, you know, deliver on that mission. So awesome. awesome Servant leadership stuff. is the term that comes to mind for me. Yep. 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 Absolutely. Which is like, how do we serve how do we serve people? You know, I think that what I learned working for some some assholes and some amazing people over the years, obviously now I I run my own companies, but when I had bosses like Bad leader thinks that people work for them. Great leader thinks that they work for the team. And I think that that's like, that's the difference. You know, we see all these like hokey images on Pinterest or Google or whatever about like, you know, the person sitting on the, the top and they're all pulling forward versus the person in the front. It's like, if you look at like a wolf pack, right? The lead wolf is not the one in the front. It's the one in the back, right? Staying behind to protect the pack, to make sure that, you can only go as fast as the slowest wolf in that pack. That's what the leader of the wolf pack is, right? So I think that's, we need more of that, right? We need a little bit less loud white guy ego and a little bit more like open, collective, feminine, nurturing energy. And I don't mean feminine by gender. I mean, just energetically, biologically, just to be clear. Um, but that's where I think that like we get it wrong. And, you know, I mean, as a young kid, right, I grew up, I was watching Bill Gates and Steve Jobs on TV, 
right? I was seeing them in the magazines, right? First time I got a leadership role, I was 20 years old, right? I was like 21 years old. And I just thought like yelling at people and being the smartest guy in the room was the way to win. You know, some of the most successful teams I led, I did 5% of the talking, you know? I asked questions, I didn't give answers. And, but I fucked that up for like, dude, I fucked that up so bad so many times, right? Like anybody that listens to this now that's worked with me over the years, like if you've worked with me before I started meditating, I apologize because I was probably like a, a train wreck. Hopefully if they work with me now or have worked with me now, they've, they've come to appreciate, at least I have good intentions. Um, try to get 1% better every day, but thanks for having me on the uh, therapy show, Rick. I appreciate that. <laughs> Anytime, my friend. <laughs> Hey, thank you so much for 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 your insights. You've got a a, a, a newsletter. Um, you want uh, people to to get signed up for? You want to tell them how yeah, to get I access really to that? Yeah, I love that. I really appreciate it. So, my website's just my name, PeteSenna dot com. Um, if it's PeteSenna dot com forward slash subscribe, I launch a bi weekly free newsletter. It's all about divergent thinking. So, I like to break down really successful companies on how they thought differently, really successful leaders how they thought differently. So, it's tips, tricks, toolkits. Um, I'm not going to try to sell you anything. I'm really just trying to give value and grow a community of, of people who use creativity and curiosity. If you've got a brand and you want to think about how to evolve that brand, you can check out digitalsurgeons.com. Um, I have an amazing team there doing amazing work for amazing people. Um, but outside of that, like I said, just really, really grateful to be on the show. I love what you're doing. I love the stance that you take in terms of just like this relentless pursuit of winning, right? Because at the end of the day, nobody wants to lose. Like lo when we lose is when we get better. But at the end of the day, like it's the pursuit of winning, right? Like if you're not, if you're not playing the game to win, why are you playing? You know? Um, and I just think that I love the name of the podcast. I love the, the approach for it. I'm just so grateful to be here. So appreciate you appreciate the audience and, uh, look forward to staying in touch. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Me too. Me too. I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful guys. Um, we're going to have all those links. We're going to have all, all of, uh, Pete's pizza. <laughs> My mouth is going on me. It, it must be that, that, uh, that camp, that caffeine uh, deprivation you were talking about. Anywho, um, we're going to have all those links on the, on the site. So you'll be able to go and check it, check it out, sign up for the uh, podcast. And again, if you've got questions or thoughts about branding, um, Pete's going to be your guy. So thanks again, man. I really enjoyed thanks, it. Thanks, Appreciate you. All right. Take care.